Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of you tuning in from around the world. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. My name is Luke, and welcome to what I'm sure is going to be a really fascinating How To Academy event. Today, we are very lucky to have with us Timothy Caulfield, Professor in Health Law and Policy at the University of Alberta, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. He has published over 350 academic articles on everything from stem cells and genetics to health policy and pseudoscience. His new book, Relax, A User's Guide to Life in the Age of Anxiety, is out now. After a 40 minute talk, Timothy will take questions from you, the audience. So please type any you have in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Don't miss your chance. Well, that's more than enough from me. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Professor Tim Caulfield. Tim, over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, Luke, and thank you to the How To Academy. Uh, it's it's a real a real pleasure to be here uh, to talk about something that I'm I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, look, today I'm going to be talking. By the way, hello from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today, really, really about about decisions. This is largely going to be a conversation about, about our daily decisions, you know, what the evidence says about, about the, those decisions, what the science says uh, about those decisions. But, but more broadly, uh, the goal is really to talk about all those social forces that impact uh, how we think about the world. Um, and this is a time to be having this conversation because to a large degree, this is a conversation about misinformation. This is a conversation about twisted science. This is a conversation about the role of, of ideology and even personal brands on the decisions that we make. And, and we know, we know that this is the era of misinformation. In fact, it's been called, it's been called the infodemic. I mean, this is the perfect time to be having this conversation. And we also know that this chaotic information environment as I always like to call it, is stressing us out. It really is stressing us out. And there's fascinating research that tells us that this, this is happening. In fact, a lot of interesting research has emerged during the pandemic. In fact, we're, we're doing some of this research ourselves at our institute. We know that this chaotic information environment is having an impact on how we see the world and the decisions that we make. In fact, in fact, there's really interesting research that talks about how, how getting your information from social media, which so many of us do, freaks us out. Uh, it, it has an impact on our ability to tease out what's real and what's not real. And it also has an impact on the likelihood that we're going to share misinformation. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end because I think that, that that's really important. But just to, to warm us ourselves up, to get a sense of the degree to which this really is a hot topic for right now, a few stats, a few stats, 96%. So this is a really interesting one and a very recent one from Canada. This just came out. Uh, this was a study that found that 96% of Canadians um, recognize that they see and consume misinformation almost daily. And you know what? That should be 100%, but it's good to know that 96% that of people recognize that reality. Uh, and that study also found that 90% of people get all their information from online sources. So, you know, this really is a ridiculous situation that we find ourselves in. And, and to give you a sense of how bizarre it's really become, uh, you know, take a look at this number. And this is one of my favorite stats because I think it really kind of illustrates where we are right now. So this is 28%, 28%. What is that? 28% of Americans believe the Bill Gates conspiracy theory in the context of the pandemic. And this is a hardcore conspiracy theory. This is really fringy, you guys. This is the idea that, that Bill Gates started the pandemic in order to force vaccination so we can put microchips in all of us to, to follow us around. Never mind that we're all carrying around a supercomputer. He could follow us that way. People believe this. Now we have to be really careful not to overinterpret those kinds of surveys. But I think it, at a minimum, it illustrates that the people are open to these kind of ideas. Uh, and, and it really shows the sort of normalization of, of conspiracy theories that were once very, 
very fringe. As you probably know, there's a lot of research out of the UK too. Early days in the in the pandemic around May, there was surveys that showed over a fifth of the population uh, in the UK believed that it was uh, a hoax. The pandemic was a hoax. In Canada, there a colleague of mine did a study that found that about half of Canadians, 46% of Canadians believe one of the big COVID conspiracy theories. And we know this misinformation is having a, an adverse impact. You know, it's leading to hospitalizations. It, it, it's leading to deaths. It, it, it's having an adverse impact on health and science policy. I think the hydroxychloroquine debacle is a, a really good example of that. And, and it's just adding to our chaotic information environment, which I'm going to come back to again and again. But, but this is another, I think, really scary stat. And this one's actually from the UK. It's Heidi Larson's group. Uh, she does fantastic work on vaccination confidence. Uh, and this study just came out again just weeks ago. It found that 6%, so there's been a 6% increase in vaccination hesitancy, which is huge, you guys. It may not sound like a lot, but that's, that's huge. A 6% increase in vaccination hesitancy as a result of the spread of misinformation. As a result, as a result of this chaotic information environment. So this topic really does matter. It really does matter. And it's a wonderful time to be having it. Um, so, look, but let's, let's come back to these daily decisions. Let's come back to these daily decisions. My new book uh, is structured around daily decisions. The, the, the gimmick, you guys, is it takes place over a typical day. You know, all the decisions that we make, you know, when to wake up, should you have coffee, you know, should you step on the scale, all the way until we go to bed at night. And, and the reason I did that is because I do think that there is fascinating research about those decisions that, and we can look at those decisions. Now, I'm not trying to tell people what the right thing to do is, but I, I want people to be aware of the evidence that is out there. But more importantly, and, and really why I wrote this book is it's, it's an excuse to look at these broader social forces, you know, misinformation, ideology, all of those things, and the impact that they have on our daily lives. They impact me, they impact you, they impact your family, they impact your community. And I think just being aware uh, of these forces, uh, it can make a difference, right? And so I, I pick this, this approach because I think it makes it relatable. It, it makes us think about the impact that these forces have on all of us day to day. And I hope, I hope that understanding these forces uh, is kind of liberating. It allows us to cut through the noise, right? And it, act, it allows us, hopefully, hopefully, to relax just a little bit. So, so I have selected, you know, a couple of topics. Some of them frivolous, some of them not so frivolous, uh, in in order to to give you a sense uh, of, of of a variety of different sources. Each one will will make a particular point uh, about about the decisions that we make and the forces that influence those decisions. Okay, so. So let's get started, okay, <laughs> let's get started. You know, you're waking up, you've woken up, you've woken up, it's, it's, it's 6.15, you're a morning person, you know, you've woken up, it's 6.15 in the morning, uh, and, and what are you gonna do? What, what are you gonna do? What's the first thing that you do? Well, 61% of you look at your phone. <laughs> you look at your phone before you get out of bed. I, I think it's within, within five minutes, 61% of you are gonna be looking at your phone. And if you're a millennial or younger, it's way more. It's way more, it's like the, it's like the norm. It's like the norm. And in fact, 75% of you are gonna continue looking at it while you're sitting on the toilet, right? So this, this matters. You know, should, first of all, should you be doing that? What does the evidence tell us about doing that? And the answer is no, you shouldn't be doing that. There's a whole bunch of interesting research. And by the way, it's hard to study this well. So we have to be careful not to overinterpret it. A lot of correlation causation uh, research. But there is research that suggests this is a bad idea because it's, it stresses you out. You know, you're not prepared to start dealing with the stuff on your phone. And, and it's just not a good way to start your day. But we're constantly drawn to it. And the other thing is, by the way, uh, that we find that you see this number, 80 percent, 80? Look, we look at our phones constantly throughout the day. And this is really where we're getting our, this, why we're being bombarded by this chaotic information environment. We we'll look at our phones constantly. So 80, 80, 80, we look at our phones 80 times while on holiday, <laughs> while on holiday. That's me, by the way. I for sure, for sure do that. So this has a real impact, just being constantly bombarded by information 
on our phones uh, can be be very, very stressful. And as I said earlier, the fascinating research that talks about how being stressed out about what we see on our phones makes it more difficult for us to tease out what's real and what's not real. Uh, it, it increases our levels of fear. It may have an adverse impact uh, on our ability to make critical assessments of the content. And there's some emerging research, including uh, work done by an experimental psychologist I work with, Gordon Pennycook, that suggests that that may cause us to share that information more. So we have this horrible misinformation cycle starting at, that starts right when you wake up, right? Right when you wake up. And also for a lot of you, when you're sitting on the toilet. So the bottom line there is probably not a good idea to start your day that way. And in fact, you guys, you shouldn't even have your phone in your bedroom. That should be someplace else. Put it to bed at night. Put it to bed at night someplace else. Uh, don't let it stress you out. Okay. So our day is continuing here. It's, you know, you've, you've gotten dressed, you know, maybe you stepped on the scale, which isn't necessarily a bad idea. Uh, it's a, research tells us that's a good way to assess uh, whether you've put on weight or not, a good way to help you, a tool to help you maintain your weight. Uh, you've gone downstairs, it's, it's, it's quarter to seven, and now you're gonna do something really important. I think it's really important anyway. You're gonna have, you're gonna have a cup of coffee. <laughs> and uh, this is a really, coffee is a really great example for me of, of the noise that we all hear around nutrition research. Um, there are so many headlines about so many different kinds of food, right? You know, you know, it's good for you. It's bad for, you know, eggs are, are bad. E eggs, eggs are good. Uh, coffee is bad. You know, we've heard that for a long time, this idea that coffee is going to put toxins in your body. Uh, coffee is going to result in adrenal fatigue, not a real ailment. Don't let that scare you away. Uh, coffee is just generally not the kind of thing that someone who embraces wellness does. Not true, right? And then on the other side of the ledger, and this is more recent kind of headlines that you know, coffee is, is good for you, right? That, that coffee actually reduces all causes of mortality, that, that coffee reduces your risk to cancer. And a very recent study suggests that it actually might reduce your risk to heart problems. So what's the reality? Well, as I said, the interesting thing about coffee is this is a really good example of how hard it is to do Nutrition research, so many of those headlines, you guys, are based on observational studies. Uh, these are studies that do not tease out uh, causation. They're very correlational in nature. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean? I, so they'll follow you know, some researchers, you know, sometimes tens, 20,000 people over a period of time, and they'll correlate certain behavior, drinking coffee, eating broccoli, to certain health outcomes. Now, that research isn't useless. It's suggestive. And if you have a whole bunch of research like that, it can be really suggestive. But, but we need to be careful not to over, over interpret it, right? And this is one of the critical thinking skills that you, that you can take away from it. Always ask yourself, always ask yourself, what kind of research is being used to make this assertion? Is coffee really bad for you? Is coffee really good for you? And what kind of research is being used? Uh, and too often, too often, those headlines, whether it's about coffee or almost anything else, are based on observational studies. In fact, there's really interesting research that suggests that the media, the popular press, loves observational studies. And, and observational studies get more play in the popular press, often because they're about things that we're interested in, like coffee, <laughs> like chocolate. That's another good example. And so they get a lot of press over the good randomized controlled trials. Um, and in fact, in fact, this 19 sort of emanating from my coffee cup here, this was a study that suggested that only 19%, it actually found that only 19% of the articles in the popular press about nutrition studies highlight that it's just an observational study, right? And that you should be, you should be cautious in the interpretation of that result. So, so what is the reality? Should you be, you know, the choice about drinking coffee? Well, the message here, as I said, Think about the research that's being used to present uh, a, a finding and ask yourself how good that research is, how reliable that study actually is. Always turn to the body of evidence on any topic. So what does the body of evidence tell us about coffee? Well, you know, I wanna be careful here. I wanna be careful here because this is an opportunity to talk about confirmation bias. I love, I love coffee. 
sort of my absolute favorite substances in the whole entire world. So I've got to watch my own confirmation bias. Now, confirmation bias, as you guys probably know, this is the mother of all of cognitive biases. And this is the tendency for all that, that we all have to find evidence that backs up pre-existing beliefs, right? And so my pre-existing belief is that coffee is awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so we're trying to set aside that confirmation bias and, and recognizing that I have it. What's the data really say about drinking coffee? Well, I think it's fair to say that the body of evidence tells us that co drinking coffee probably isn't bad for you for most people and might be a little bit good for you. So go ahead, drink up, have that cup of coffee and let's move through our day. Okay, so we're moving through our day. That's what we're doing now. It's, it's 7 a.m. You're a morning person, as I said. And so now, now it's time for breakfast. Breakfast. So breakfast is a fascinating topic too. It really, it really is a fascinating topic. Um, it's often been held out as the most important meal of the day. You guys have heard that, right? The most important meal of the day. Uh, but what does the science actually say about that? Well, this is an example of how despite the embrace of a cultural norm, the most important meal of the day, uh, the evidence is actually much more confused, much more complex, much, much, much more mixed than, than often believed. And, and, and this is so true with, with breakfast. You know, there's research that has suggested that it's, you know, it helps, helps your, your cognition. It makes you more creative. It gives you more energy. And there's been a lot of studies exploring the role of, of having breakfast and weight loss or weight maintenance. But as I said, in reality, the evidence is actually very, very mixed. So why, why do we believe? Why do we believe that breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Well, we, we need to explore where that social norm came from. And, and to a large degree, it came from marketing. <laughs> it came from marketing. Kellogg, uh, the, the big cereal guy, uh, pushed the idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the, dia, of the day so he could sell cereal. And he, he really believed that, you know, hardworking people got up early and they had breakfast. So it almost became the moral thing to do, the righteous thing to do. You know, if you were a hardworking individual, you had breakfast. And that norm took hold. And it has had an impact on our perception of breakfast. And it's had, an, I think, an impact on how the research around breakfast is being presented. So this is a good example when it comes to a decision that you shouldn't be swayed by what appears in pop culture to be a definitive conclusion. You need to recognize that the research is actually very mixed. The most important thing is to do what's healthy for you, right? what works for you in the rhythm of your day. So no definitive answer here, which is interesting in itself, right? You really can relax about this decision and, and ignore sort of that pop, that pop culture noise. Okay, so what do we got next? So, you know, you've had your breakfast and, and let's say you have kids, right? You've got kids and, and now the kids have got to get to school, right? They've got to get to school. Um, in my world, that's around eight o'clock. I'm not sure what's happening in the UK right now around that, but let's say it's not pandemic time and they, they actually do have to leave. My, my kid is actually back in class. My, my high school student is back in class now. Um, uh, it's eight o'clock. So how do your kids get to school? This is a fascinating one, and I'm going to dig a little bit into this one. Increasingly, over the past decades, kids are not walking to school anymore. Now, in North America, uh, what's the number one reason for that? Uh, how are kids getting to school? They're being driven by their parents uh, to school. Now, why is that the case? Now, this, I, I recognize that off the top, I want to say that this is a complex decision, right? There's a lot going on. You know, sometimes it has to do with the fact that parents are driving by the school anyway. It, it's more time efficient. Um, but if you believe the research, and again, recognizing that this is a complex decision. If you believe the research, one of the number one reasons, especially in North America, but also in other countries, the number one reason is stranger danger, fear of crime, fear that your kid is going to be abducted or assaulted on the way to school. And that has been driv driving much of the decisions. In fact, there's some research that suggests that distance from the school is not that determinative. In other words, it's other factors like, like fear of crime, fear of abduction. Um, and qualitative research has suggested, even sometimes when parents suggested something else, when you dig a little deeper, 
that's at the core uh, of the fear. But, but look at this number. What's the reality here? What's the reality here? Uh, one in, in 14 million. Actually, some of my colleagues worked on, uh, on this. Uh, that's the reality. That's the chance of your kid actually being abducted on the way to school. It is phenomenally rare. It's so rare, you can classify it as not going to happen. Uh, it's that rare. It's that rare. Um, in fact, um, it's so rare, uh, I think that it's unusual that we allow it to, to skew our, our beliefs. Look, I've got four kids. I, I recognize I recognize that fear and I totally understand we've, we've lost our kids before. And the, you know, I know that blood to the brain fear of something horrible happening to your kid. And there's something visceral, right? Something visceral about your kid being abducted. It's the, the, a nightmare, the worst fear of a parent, right? So, so this, I understand why this can dominate our, our decision-making in this category, but let's break this down a little bit. You have this fear, this fear, which is so unlikely, right? So unlikely versus a host of benefits to letting your kid walk to school. You know, they, they'll get exercise and we know that kids need more exercise than they're, that they're getting right now. Uh, th th it might be an opportunity to socialize with their kids. It might be an opportunity uh, for, for independence, right? You know, to you know, exercise a little bit of independence on their way to school. Uh, it, it also might just be fun or, or an opportunity for a little bit of reflection in, in an otherwise busy, busy life. So we're weighing this fear uh, against these other, you know, tangible benefits, but these benefits are much more amorphous, right? They're, they're hard to measure, hard to pin down, um, as opposed to this incredible, you know, this sharp fear. So why, why do we make this calculation? What's going on? Well, this is a good opportunity to dig in a little bit deeper on a lot of the cultural forces that impact a host of decisions.